This is why I always keep the introduction short, because I'll just do it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Quick tell you that. <laughs> other than what you've just heard, just so you, you know why I'm here. Um, basically, I come from a graphic design background. I worked in graphic design for a short period before I started an illustration agency in the mid, in the early 1980s, I'm very old. And I did that for three years, then got ill, long-term ill. And while I was recovering I, and I'd wound down my company. I went to the Association of Illustrators as a volunteer, and I've been there ever since. They pay me now. And I talk to illustrators about how the industry works and how to get from point A to point B in it, and basically home in on the areas that they're interested in and their suitability for those areas because some people aren't particularly clued up about that. Um, and I also see people who are uh, professional illustrators who are considering a change of illustrative direction and I see people who are self-taught and I see people who are fine artists, textile designers, graphic designers, set designers, fashion designers, etc, etc. So quite a wide variety of people, quite a wide variety of discussions, some people are thinking about getting an agent and they want to know what agents do and what they don't do, others are thinking of changing their agent, but most of them are people who are starting out in the illustration industry and looking to promote themselves effectively in it, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Um, and I guess if anybody's got any questions, it's probably better to ask me at the end because I usually cover as many eventualities as I can along the way. So if you have got any questions, jot them down and ask me at the end and I'll try and cover as much ground as I can, speaking very, very quickly. Um, so, okay, before I, I talk about portfolio presentation, I'm going to be talking about print and digital portfolio presentation because both are still relevant and the underlying thought when you put a portfolio together, whether it's online, whether it's on a laptop, whether it's in a physical portfolio, is still the same. Um, I want to talk a bit about certain things you need to know regarding the UK industry, assuming that you are going to be working as illustrators here. Um, one of the things that I learned as an agent is that most commissioners are spoiled and lazy and a bit thick and it's because we have more illustrators than they have jobs available and over the decades what that means is that commissioners get used to being able to pick and choose exactly the right person for exactly <coughs> the right job and being able to take their cue from each illustrator's portfolio. So they like to categorise people, they like to pigeonhole people, they need to know exactly where they are with people because the fact that they've got so much to choose from means that they're not very happy about taking risks. They never have to take risks. So what this means is that overall you will very rarely see lousy illustration out there you'll see illustration that isn't your personal taste, but that is a completely different thing from illustration that looks like it was done by a drunk 14-year-old doing a graphics GMVQ. So essentially, it means you have a good standard of illustration. But the reluctance of clients to take risks means that you do have to spoon feed them and it also manifests itself in them liking to see one strong recognisable way of working. I hesitate to use the word style because I'm aware that a lot of people run around like headless chickens at your stage in the proceedings going, no I haven't got style. Um, by style, I don't mean that the work necessarily has to be highly stylized. 
It can be. It might be totally naturalistic. It might be informational. It might be humorous. It might be decorative. It might be narrative. It might be conceptual. It can be any of those things. It just needs to look like you've done it. Um, and as long as it looks like you have made this piece of work and most of the work in your portfolio also looks like it was made by the same person, you'll be golden. There are very few genuine, what I would call, one-person studios in the world. Um, I have seen maybe 10, 15 in the last however many millions of years I've been doing this, 30 years I've been doing this. Um, but generally, um, most illustrators are better at some things than others. So if you do have multiple illustrative styles, my advice to you would be to separate them if they are diametrically opposed. So if you've got a nice line of spiky political satire and you also illustrate books for two to four year olds, it's way better to separate them into different portfolios, different sections on your website, <coughs> even different websites if you really want to confuse people as little as possible. Um, and to chuck out anything that you personally believe that other people can do ten times better than you. You will never please all clients. You can never be all things to all clients in the UK because we've just got too many other illustrators out there. So it's way better to play to your strengths and get rid of the stuff that confuses people. It's also part of the British psyche that we cherish uniqueness. We love eccentricity. We love one-offs. We like people who are definitely recognisable. Um, and I think that combined with how spoiled clients are really does make it very important for <coughs> illustrators to have a keen sense of who they are and market themselves accordingly. Um, so okay, that's given you the, the background information. Um, it's getting harder and harder to make face-to-face uh, -face appointments with clients, um, but they do still happen. I see working illustrators all the time and they are still going to see clients, so it's my belief that if you can get your foot in the door, where geographically practicable, that you should do because personal interviews with clients gives you face-to-face, -face, <coughs> honest industry feedback and you all need that when you're first going out in the world and marketing yourself. Um, but it also opens other opportunities to you. Um, you know, you may just get chatting and the client may make it very obvious that they really like your work and they might say, oh, actually, there's, there's a guy who works on such and such a magazine upstairs. He'd really like your work. I'm going to ring him up now and see if he'll come down or see if you can go up there and show him your work. So there's that kind of thing. And, there's, and even if they don't say that, you can ask them. If they make it fairly apparent that they like your work, you can ask them if there's anyone else they know that would be interested. And that way you get over the horrible cold calling thing right from the get-go. Um, so I would always advise it because clients who are busy, and most clients are very busy because most art departments are getting smaller and smaller and smaller thanks to new technology which isn't so new anymore, and, and also market forces and recessions and, and people holding on for grim death. So the average art department has shrunk immeasurably from what it would have been 10, 15, 20 years ago. You've now got one person doing what would have been half a dozen people's work. And commissioning illustration is only one thing on their schedule. So it's, it's good if you can possibly get remembered and you're more likely to be remembered if you become someone that the art editor or art director has met. Because when they're under pressure and they suddenly think, oh God, I should have commissioned that person uh, last week and, and I left a message on their answer phone, they didn't get back to me, and oh my God, oh my God, I need that illustration on Tuesday morning, they are more likely to ask somebody they know. So you have to become somebody they know, by hook or by crook. Um, and I won't lie, it's very nerve-wracking 
seeing someone you don't know and laying your creative soul out in front of them, whatever medium you use to do it, it's worrying. Um, and there are certainly ways you can minimise the chance of making a less than positive presentation. Um, and they are to become objective about your work. You need to become your own inner tutor, inner critic. You know, you've, you've been at art school for the last four years or so. You have feedback from all your tutors. You have feedback from your peers. You have feedback from visiting lecturers. You have feedback from your flatmates. And you are so used to getting, hey, that's good, oh no, I prefer that, all the time. Um, all of a sudden, unless you are going to be setting up a studio in Hull and trying to replicate the studio situation you've been in at college, which some people do, they start collectives and they do do <coughs> that, unless you're doing that, suddenly you're going to be plunged into a kind of abyss where th that voice isn't there anymore. You have to do it yourself. So you need to be honest with yourself and objective about your work. Otherwise, you will be put into a difficult situation. And ideally, you want to be somewhere where you can, you can talk easily about everything in your portfolio. You don't want to be in a situation where you're thinking, don't, don't ask me about that, I don't really like that. Um, I cannot tell you how many really duff presentations I've seen. I'll give you an example, or two examples actually, fairly recent. Um, one of them, I saw an ex-Central St Martins graduate, and I said, so, you know, tell me about you, what, what's brought you here to the AOI today? She said, well, you're the first person I've ever shown this to. I left college five years ago, and I've never shown this to anybody else. And I said, oh, why is that? You know, just making chatty commentary, thinking, you know, oh, she's probably been working in a building society, paying off her mountainous student debt for the last five years, like most people are. And, and she said, oh, I just don't think I'm very good, really. <laughs> so that was one. Um, the other one was even worse, and he was even more recent, so my usual, hi, how are you, what are you doing here today, what's brought you here today, oh, he said, I'm not very good at making money, and then he sort of laughed in a very self-deprecating manner and said, let's put it this way, after you've seen me, your day's going to get a lot better. <laughs> so you do not want to be making presentations like that. And the only reason those people were making presentations like that is because they hated what was in their portfolio. So how they expected anybody else to respond to it favourably, I don't know. Now, I don't think that it's normal for a creative person to be 100% chuffed with everything in their portfolio. I think it's realistic to aim for 87% happy with what's in your portfolio because as we all know, you do something, it's like giving birth, you look at it and you think, that's the best bit of work I've ever done. That's the best bit of work anybody's ever done. That is fantastic. And then three weeks later you're looking at it thinking, oh, I wish I hadn't done that bit right. Oh, oh why did I use that colour? Ooh. So, you know, that happens to everybody and you'll never feel really, really, really uber confident with everything for a sustained period of time. But as long as you are relatively pleased with it, and as long as you are happy to be asked to talk about it. Because I've also had people say to me, oh, I hate that. <coughs> My second year tutor thought I should leave it in just to show I can do it. Well, that's not really how to start your career. Your client needing spoon feeding will take their cue from you. And that means if it isn't in your portfolio, they'll assume you either can't do it or don't want to do it. If it is in your portfolio, they will assume that you do want to do it. So what could be worse than showing them work that you don't personally like and then being asked to do 20 more pieces just like it? So. You have to tell yourself, okay, is there anything in this portfolio that I actually wins when I look at it? I don't want anybody asking me about that because I'm going to say negative things about it because I don't really believe in it. 
So if you think it's weak or inferior to the majority of the work, out it comes. Um, secondly, anything that isn't stylistically representative of what you want to do. Now, a lot of weird real life briefs come into universities. And a lot of the time, they're not, oh, thank you. This will, be, this will be interesting. I'll wait for it to get a bit warmer. That's better. You'll have to excuse me for gloves. My mouth is as dry as a proverbial parrot <laughs> and tastes just as nice. Um, so, okay, where was I? Um, stuff that's a real life brief that, that isn't actually a proper client. It's not an art director or a designer, you know, they know where to get professional illustrators from. It's some self-published person or it's somebody who doesn't normally ever need illustration, who isn't a graphic designer, but who finds themselves in a situation where one time in their life they need an illustrator and they don't know where to go. So they'll either ask their 14-year-old nephew who's doing the graphics, GMBQ, or somebody will say to them, you want to go up the local art school, you do, get a student to do it, they'll do it for three and save me. <laughs> so you end up with somebody showing you a piece of somebody else's work and saying, can you rip this off? And you think, mm, I'd rather poke needles in my eyes, but yeah, because they're paying me money. So you end up with this published piece of work in your portfolio. And the thinking goes, I've got to keep it in my portfolio because it's published, and if I don't have published work, nobody will ever use me, and it becomes this awful catch-22. Particularly if the published piece in your portfolio is not who you really are and not who you really want to be. So I'm here to tell you, it, even if it's published, it's doing you no favours, it comes out. I can get you over the hurdle of how to get published work. However, if it's not what you want to do, and if it's really what other people do, and you don't want to do that, it shouldn't be in there. Similarly, if you cannot physically repeat something, it shouldn't be in there either. A very good example of this is people who do printmaking. If you can replicate certain printmaking techniques at home, like lino cut, unless you're doing those really, really huge scale lino cuts, that's easy to do at home on your kitchen table or your bedroom floor. Um, you know, you can make certain sort of rudimentary presses in order to do that. But most people don't have etching facilities at home. And even if, uh, do they do printmaking here? I can't remember, mm -hmm. they do. Right, even if your tutors have said, oh, you can come back and use the printmaking facilities, you might be able to do it once or twice. But if it's the summer break, or it's 8 o'clock at night, or it's a Sunday morning, no, you can't. And that means that if you are a printmaker and you are doing stuff that needs specialist equipment, wherever you're going to be headed, you need to sort out a studio where you either rent a space permanently or you can rent it on an as and when basis. So there are places like Print Club in London where you can do that kind of thing. Um, but if you cannot do that, you cannot show people the work that you've made using those techniques because basically what you're saying is, look at this, it's great, isn't it? You can't have it. So total waste of time. Um, and similarly, people who have really, really, really huge periods of time um, that they need to put into work. I have seen people who took too long to turn around a piece of work. When I say too long, I mean in one case, a girl took nearly five months to do one piece of work, and no client, not even a publishing client, has got five months to wait till you do one illustration. And frankly, since that means you do two and a half illustrations a year, nobody can pay you enough to keep you going. Um, so if the way you work is humongously labour intensive, you've got to look into ways of doing something that isn't, that has a similar feel for you. How you do that is up to you, but you can't make a living if it takes you a thousand years to do a piece of work. 
So that comes out of the portfolio as well. Um, so, okay, you've, you've taken those things out and you're going to have to fill them with things that are relevant. And that is to do with knowing your market because what a good portfolio has to do, by which I mean an effective professional portfolio, is to say to your clients, this is who I am, stylistically speaking, media-wise, and this is how you can use me, which <coughs> means if you're going to see a gardening magazine, you better have two or three pieces about gardening in your portfolio, otherwise they will think you are a time waster. What clients aren't is maverick patrons of the arts and philanthropists. I'm here to help illustrators. They're there to help themselves. All that's going on in their head is, is this person any good? What have I got on at the moment that I might possibly use them for? So you have to make sure that you've done your homework and you know what they use and you know it's your kind of work and you have a couple of relevant samples in the portfolio. Now, if I go back to the metaphorical gardening magazine, in actuality, the art editor of that metaphorical gardening magazine would really like it if every portfolio he saw was full to the gunnels with botanical illustration. What they'll put up with is a portfolio that's, got, that's general, but it's got some gardening illustration in it. So you can't please everybody, but you better make sure that you can please the people that you've actually drawn up a short list to go and see. You can't expect to go in there and say, I'm a good drawer, think of something for me to draw for you, because that's absolutely not the way they work. So, um, I'm going to talk about presentation itself, and I'm going to talk about print presentation first, because as I say, a lot of the underlying thinking is exactly the same, whether it's virtual or whether it's physical but there are 101 more ways to go wrong if it's virtual. So I thought we'd get the simple stuff over with first. Now, um, if we're talking physical portfolios, A3 or A4 are industry standard. Anything bigger than that, take it away. Um, if somebody comes to see me with an A2 or worse still, A1 or A0 portfolio, I know this is somebody starting from scratch. I have had somebody, a couple of people actually, who brought portfolios that were so huge they couldn't open them up on my living room table, on my living room floor. I have a coffee table. It's a reasonable size coffee table. If a portfolio fails the coffee table test, you know it's in serious get rid of it territory. So most art directors have a desk about this big and most of those desks have every bit as much crap as that one's got on it. In fact, the Mac will be twice the size. So where are they supposed to open up this portfolio that needs 12 pallbearers to bring into the room? And you don't want it if you're on London transport in the rush hour. I once sat on the train and I had my portfolio resting against my legs and the train jolted and it fell with some force onto the calves of the woman opposite me. She'd probably sue me now. And I just had to sit there while the welts on her legs got bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, you don't want that shit. So something that's small and portable and easy for people to unzip, rest on the side of their desk and just look at. Um, so A3 or A4 is fine, either or both works for most clients. If your work is gigantic, get it reduced. If your university, like the one I teach at, doesn't have a ginormous scanner, um, because most people don't have a, a really huge flatbed scanner, do they have one here? I don't A3, A3, yeah. If it's A2 or A1, you either have to scan it in sections and kind of tidy it up on the computer, or you have to go in, in search of an old-fashioned printer that's got a scanning drum, assuming that the work is flexible. Obviously, if it's digital, it would be any size. So whatever works for you, get it reduced. Do not 
cart it around in a massive portfolio and also do not lean it against the garden fence on an overcast day or the garage door and take rubbish snapshots with it um, because I wish I could say that's a joke but I still get handed bunches of boots snaps of really really badly lit appallingly photographed work and my favourite is when you see it in a frame photograph of it in a frame on a wall in an exhibition with light bouncing off the glass in the frame because that's really helpful so none of that stuff and similarly if your work is huge if it's three-dimensional if it's very delicate it also needs photographing so if you've done some mock-ups of packaging and it's going to fall to pieces if you keep handing the actual thing around if you've done some really delicate fabulous pop-up toy theater or something you get it photographed properly by someone who knows what they're doing you have technicians you have subsidized stuff here so take advantage of it all while you're still here because it's hideously expensive when you leave um, okay plastic leaves plastic leaves cost quite a lot of money and you don't want to have to keep buying them if you have an art care style portfolio where the work hangs from a central spine and you mount your work within mounts, within mounts, within mounts, or within very heavy mounting paper or on very heavy mounting paper, your leaves are going to split from the outside in the moment you pick up that portfolio. So if you don't like the black paper, put it on something else or print it out so that it, it bleeds to the edges of the plastic leaves but plastic leaves are really important even if you don't like them aesthetically I have people say things to me like I don't like the plastic leaves they're dull my colors welcome to the world of reprographics no color you ever use in any image in any medium will look anything like it when it's printed so I can promise you a plastic leaf yeah it might make a bit of a difference from a pedantic sort of point of view but it's not going to make any difference to a client and I have physically dragged original watercolours away from somebody about to stick their coffee on it and I also know a technical illustrator who had a client burn a hole in a piece of work that took him weeks because he had a fag on when he was looking at it and I know you can't smoke in public places, but some designers work from home and they can smoke like chimneys if they want. So please protect your artwork because even if it's not an original, like that watercolor I rescued, it costs a lot of money to get an A3 photograph printed. It costs in printing ink, it costs in photographic paper, and you don't want to have to be <coughs> forking out 25, 30 quid just because some idiot spilt tea on your work. Me. <laughs> um, one thing that goes along with A1 portfolios as the mark of the rank amateur um, is things in the portfolio that really shouldn't be there. And one of the top things that really shouldn't be there is life drawings. If you couldn't draw a naked lady freezing to death in front of a four bar fire in a studio, you wouldn't be there. You wouldn't be an illustrator. Every illustrator does that stuff. It will be your, your ability to draw from observation will be evidenced in every piece of finished illustration that you show them. So you don't have to show them the ground rules. It's, I, I can't even think of an analogy. It's like a big famous architect going to a meeting with some really important client with a trowel and a thing of cement. It's not necessary and it makes you look amateurish. Um, and the key word here is context and content. What is in your portfolio should be illustration, not just drawing. It should be illustration, which means it's got to have some kind of relevance to the clients you're showing it to. Um, now, if I give you an example of something that frequently goes horribly wrong and I actually saw a portfolio like this at the beginning of the week exactly like this rather timely um, people say to me I'm, you know I always say so you know tell me a bit about yourself I like drawing buildings 
Okay, don't have a problem with that at all. As an agent, I work with two illustrators who like drawing buildings. One of them could draw from architectural plans, and the other one couldn't, but did beautiful atmospheric drawings of, of well-known landmarks. So the one who could do architectural plans used to do stuff for estate agents and, and uh, architectural partnerships and, and building companies. So, you know, somebody would be doing a brochure, selling some luxury warehouse development and it hadn't been developed yet and he would have to look at the plans and draw and paint what it was going to look like when it was. Uh, you get that in brochures. I've even seen ginormous watercolours of the way a building is going to look uh, printed on hoardings put around a building site so it looked like the building was already there. So that's the kind of work he did. The other illustrator who did the beautiful atmospheric stuff, he would have been used by people like English Heritage and the National Trust. Um, he was asked to do a book about eating out in Paris bistros where he'd been flown to Paris and drawn people eating out in Paris bistros. Um, and he did uh, an illustration of the Harrods Food Hall as it was when it was built with people in Edwardian dress, which Harrods took and used portions of for a stationary range they were doing. So they wrapped a bit of it round an address book and a lot of it round a box file and so forth. So both of them, I have no problem with illustrators who like drawing buildings. However, when nine out of ten illustrators who say I like drawing buildings to me say that, I look in their folder and it's full of very energetic, very exciting, very gritty urban landscape. It's full of drawings of really crappy, disused dockyards and light industrial buildings with broken windows covered in graffiti and horrible old 1960s shopping centres with beleaguered pensioners dragging their tartan shopping trolleys through the ruins. Um, it's great, you know, I'd hang it on my wall, but if I was a client, I think you were a towering wanker. Because it belongs in a gallery, it doesn't belong in a portfolio. So if you like drawing buildings, draw something that looks like something they'd use. You're using the same skills, but let's see Hamleys at Christmas, or Harrods at night, or the Sydney Opera House, or Leeds Castle, or something not some horrible condemned shopping precinct. So it's, it's using, I, I hesitate to use the word commercial because I know that's an absolutely filthy, stinking, disgusting word when you're at art school because I was a student and because I thought it was too. And because it has connotations with selling out and prostitution and blandness and, you know, becoming part of the machine and God knows what else, trendy bandwagon jumping, and it could be any of those things, but all it really means when I use it is relevant to the needs of whoever you're going to see. Ergo, an infinite variety of illustration can be commercial, and that's what I mean when I use it. So the content of your portfolio should be relevant to the clients you're going to see. You cannot expect them to look at that really exciting drawing of a crane in a dockyard and know that you're the person they're going to use on the front cover of a Thompson's holiday brochure because it just doesn't communicate itself in that way. So it had better be interesting, recognisable, picturesque, atmospheric, something other than falling to bits and covered in graffiti, please. Um, and the same goes for anything else that you're interested in doing. If your thing is portraiture, uh, do some portraits of well-known people, do some narrative work, put your portraiture skills in a context that the client who's looking at it can understand. Okay, so anything else before I go on to digital? Yeah, there aren't any rather there isn't a finite number of pieces to put in your portfolio. I've heard all kinds of old nonsense over the years. Oh, no more than 10, no more than 20, no more than 18. It depends on who you are, how you work, and how much of a potential clientele you've got. Because if your work is highly complex and detailed, and you only want to do children's books for the five to seven year old range, and you're only interested in folk art and fairy stories and, and stuff like that, you can probably get away with 15 pieces because they're going to be all aimed at the same client. 
and they're just basically saying, well, I can do children and I can do adults and I can do animals and I can do, you know, fantastical beings and, and that's about it, really. If, on the other hand, you are a conceptual cartoonist with a really pared-down style who does one-off gags, humorous responses in response to a sort of grotty, dull, dry copy, and you originate cartoon strips, you're going to need more than 15 pieces. You might need 45 pieces to show the diversity of clients that your work is likely to serve, what you can do for them. So my advice is to think about it logically and don't put so many pieces in you bore your potential client to death, but don't put so few pieces in that they blink and miss the work that's relevant to them. Also, the um, mounting thing, um, mounting on black and white. There are a lot of colleges that have a bug up their garters about, oh, everything's got to be mounted on black. Everything's got to be mounted on white. No, it bleeding doesn't. If your work is brooding and dark and gothic and has lots and lots of black in it and you mount it on black, nobody will see it. By the same token, if your work is delicate and ethereal with spindly little lines and, and, and washes of colour that are hardly there at all, if you put it on white, it's going to disappear. So I don't care what colour you mount your work on, just as long as it doesn't dominate or overshadow your work. As long as it is complementary to your work, and as long as the first thing you see is the work, not, oh my god, lorex and glitter and sequins, then it's working. Um, the other thing about mounting work, and this is more of a personal bugbear than a professional one, although it is kind of professional as well, and it's also practical. Um, there is a certain school of thought that says, only have a piece of work on the right-hand page, and leave the left-hand page blank. And the amount of portfolios I look at like that, where it looks like something's been taken out, it makes your portfolio twice as heavy as it needs to be, means you have to buy twice as many leaves to lug around nothing. Um, but more importantly, it just strikes me as incredibly precious. Because in the real world, you do a book cover for Penguin, and it's got to be in Waterstones, right? When you walk into Waterstones, it's not going to be in solitary splendour on top of a marble plinth right in the middle of the shop. It's going to be on a big table or a big bookcase vying for your attention with 80 other books, 200 other books. So I really think that a piece of your work can stand to hold its own against another piece of your work on the opposite side. So that's my, my precious rant over. Um, I'm going to talk about digital presentation now um, because that is a whole another can of worms. And I've spent the last 10 years seeing how many creative ways it can go horribly wrong. And I'm only just starting to see ways it can go right. And I don't think I'm finished learning how many ways it can go wrong yet, because there are progressively more and more ways you can promote yourself by using online <coughs> methods. So you need to use exactly the same kind of logic as you do putting together a print portfolio, putting together a virtual presentation. Now there are a lot of options when you're putting together a virtual presentation. If it's a matter of laptop versus tablet, and it was me, I would go for the tablet every time. The first time I saw a presentation on a tablet, um, the iPad hadn't been going that long, um, but America took to it very quickly, particularly the graphic design fraternity, and it was a Brazilian illustrator who lived in New York who worked as a graphic designer as well, and he just handed me this iPad. But at the time, I'd never used one. And I found I could just use it. It was great. It was just like a print presentation. It had none of the nervous breakdown-inducing stuff that any laptop presentation I'd seen up till that time had. Uh, it took the same amount of time, which is a big plus. 
Um, and it had the added bonus of me being able to go like that if I wanted to see something in a more detailed way. So if money is no object and you have the opportunity, I would advocate if you're going to do a print, uh, a digital presentation using an iPad or similar. Um, with laptops, I'll tell you the things that people have done with laptops. I have had people who borrowed somebody else's laptop and didn't know how to use it, so I had to give the presentation myself because it was the same as mine. Fortunately, otherwise I'd never have seen the work. I had somebody drop their computer the night before and the, the screen was hanging off by sparking <laughs> wires and we had to lean it up against a pile of books and stand well back. I've seen people who had no running order whatsoever and were going, it's on my Facebook page. Oh no, it isn't. It's on my Flickr. No, no, no. It's on my AOI portfolio. No, no, no. It's in a file. Oh, go away. I've seen people who have sworn blind. They've uploaded images the night before and the files vanished. I've had people upload images that were reversed out. I still don't know how they did that. Um, I had somebody set... Um, a set period slideshow where each image was on the screen for about 40 seconds. I only have an hour with people at the AOI. He wanted to show me about 70 images. Not really great. In the end, after about a quarter of an hour of it, I said, look, you know what? I've seen enough. I've got the feel for it. Let's stop this now. Because um, I sure as hell don't want to spend 50 minutes or 60 minutes looking at somebody's work because I can tell whether it's you know, they need help and in what areas they need help very quickly. Um, I saw somebody who showed me her website and then said, I've got some other things that I really want you to see on a memory stick. Fine, no problems, put it in. Um, and the images must have been about 2 million DPI because they took an eternity to open these files. And you know what was in them? All of them? life drawings. <laughs> and you know what she was? A fashion illustrator. I rest my case. Um, so yeah, those are sort of things that, that go wrong. Um, if you, you've got so many different ways of showing your work. You know, you can do it as a slideshow. You can, if you're using iPad, you can download various apps that, that make showing your work fairly simple. There's more and more of them. Some of them are free. You can just use iPhoto. It works just as well. Um, but on a laptop, you can visit an online portfolio. So you might have one on a hosting site with the AOI or the iSpot, or you might have a website um, it might have been designed for you, or you might be on Moonfruit, or Wix, or Weebly, or Fallspace, or Jimdo, or any of these others, and there's more and more and more of them happening all the time. Um, the days of needing somebody to um, design you a website, you don't really need to do that now, and just renting a space on Moonfruit for a year is about 40 quid. And all the software is, is, all the code is done for you, and it really is a matter of you choosing a pretty template and saying, yeah, I want Garamond, I don't like Comic Sans, <laughs> or nobody likes Comic Sans apart from my mother. Um, and, you know, you, you literally just put everything where you want it, and you choose the layout that's most sensible to you. Um, and if you want to, walk somebody through your blog or walk somebody <coughs> through your website or walk somebody through your blog and then go on to an archive somewhere else. You can do all that. It's limitless the amount of work that you can take with you. But that doesn't mean that your portfolio presentation should be taking 10 times as long as if you were doing a print presentation. It's kind of like with sketchbooks. Some clients love sketchbooks. Some clients are more interested in sketchbooks than they are in your actual illustration. But some clients despise them and don't want to look at them. So with a print presentation, you take a sketchbook or two as an optional extra. And when they finish looking at the work, you can say, do, do you want to have a look at my sketchbook? 
And it's exactly the same with a digital presentation. You have a running order. You have a finite amount of images. If you want to take them to YouTube because you've got some animation, you've got some GIFs or something, that's all absolutely fine. But you need to have a running order and you need it not to go on and on and on and on and on because clients haven't got that much time. And the other thing that I should have said is when you do get a face-to-face -face appointment, very often you won't have more than five or ten minutes with a client and they may not be terribly chatty and they may not necessarily laugh at all your jokes and they may just zip through it like this and say, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, thank you very much for, for coming in. Um, really interesting work, we'll keep you on file. And you will leave there thinking, I want to die. They hate me. <laughs> Why did I ever get up this morning? Why did I waste the money on a ticket going to see a client that hates me? They don't hate you. Believe me, if they hated you, you'd really know about it. They actually mean, thanks for coming in, we'll keep your work on file. Because when you are a graphic designer, or in my case an ex-agent, you can look through a portfolio in 30 seconds flat and know whether somebody is good and right for you. In my case, I'm looking for areas of weakness, areas of strength, you know, all, all kinds of, oh, yeah, this person ought to be going to see that kind of client, or, whoa, that needs to come out. You know, they're not looking with that kind of mindset at all. As I said, they're just looking to see that you make the grade and, and your work is relevant to their needs. And you can determine that knowledge very, very quickly. So don't feel like you've been an abject failure when you have one of those. Because I used to feel like that when I was first an agent, and almost every time, that is the bastard that gives you your first job. The one that didn't crack a smile, didn't really want to chat, and just said, yeah, yeah, thanks very much. They will ring you up with exactly the most brilliant job. The ones that talk to you for three hours, <laughs> make you cups of tea, talk about your cat and your record collection, those people never give you a job. They hate their job which is why they're bunking off with an illustrator for three hours. They will give you a job when they've been fired or where they found a job somewhere else that lets them use illustration, which is another reason why they're bunking off with an illustrator for three hours. They're the, the, the sort of slow burn, long term client development thing. But the people who actually don't like your work, you know, they say they don't like your work. And, um, you know, if you've done your homework and and you know you should be there, then they shouldn't be saying things like that, and you will know that it's their problem, not yours, because you will do your homework. Um, before I get on to the kind of clients you should be targeting with your portfolio, because there is definitely a sensible way of doing that, um, I just want to say that I am aware that your student portfolio has to go through a period of transformation before you see clients because your tutors and external assessors have a completely different set of criteria to potential clients. Now I'm not saying, oh, dump your final major project and just, you know, do hardcore commercial boring <coughs> stuff at yeah. all. You're here to get a degree, you're here to have as much fun as you can while you're simultaneously having a breakdown about putting a degree show up. And you should be being as creative as possible right now. I'm telling you this stuff so that come June, July, when you leave, you know what you should be doing next. Because there is almost always a period of transformation. Your tutors and external assessors want to see that you've changed, you've grown, you've experimented, You've done all kinds of, of, of stuff to evolve during your period here. And that includes failing and going down blind alleys and coming out and doing something completely different. Clients never want, they, they, they never want to think that you have an off day in your life. They want to see a consistent body of work that's relevant to them. If they see work that's kind of a bit it's not so good or it, it's not really commercially aware, what that does is it introduces a little element of doubt into their subconscious where they're thinking, are we going to get this person on a good day or a not so good day? Do they actually know what they're doing? If they knew what they were doing, why would this piece be in here? So you do have to spend a time 
sort of assessing the contents of your portfolio and thinking, you know what, this is all a bit one note, this is all to do with my FMP, and my FMP isn't necessarily that commercial, so much as I love it, I think some of it should come out, and I think I should do some samples like this instead. I have, in all the years I've spent doing this peripatetic lecturing, and it's a very long time now, I have seen, literally, I can count them on the fingers of one hand, the portfolios that were industry ready and I could give you names and everything. I think I've seen three. Um, and one of them was David Hitch, who's a total <coughs> genius and started getting work before he even left college. Um, one of the others was somebody who just turned it all around. He'd never finished a project in his entire time at art school. And in his <coughs> Easter break, he decided to get the independent every day for three weeks and to do a one day brief every single day. And so when I saw his portfolio, it was unbelievably industry ready. And his tutors thought they were going to have to fail him up until that point because he'd never ever finished anything. Um, but I came along and thought, wow, this guy knows what he's doing. So it doesn't matter when you get there, just as long as you do. Um, so, okay. The way people generally get from here to there, where the professional illustrators are, is they usually get magazine jobs. Editorial is really important, and a lot of people will say to me when I'm sounding them out, oh, I'm not very editorial, and they say it in that tone of voice, and I know exactly why. It's because at the beginning of their second year, they were set a really shitty editorial brief, which totally traumatised them and put them off editorial for life, and it's usually conceptual, and it's usually for the New Scientist or The Guardian or some boring business publication, and they're not a conceptual illustrator. But they are so freaked out by it, they just think, mm -hmm, editorial. Um, I can promise you that editorial is not a style, it's a genre. And whatever kind of an illustrator you want to be, editorial uses every sort of conceivable style and technique, and it covers every conceivable subject matter. So the kind of, of thing I mean is, if you want to be a children's book illustrator, it's very easy to think, no, I'm not doing editorial. Well, there are magazines for preschool and school-aged children. There are magazines for expectant mothers, people with young families. There are general interest magazines that have a children's supplement or a children's page. Uh, there are magazines for professionals who work with children, like kindergarten teachers and childminders and brownie pack readers, and do I really have to go on? So all of those magazines will use child-friendly styles for a wide variety of reasons. If it's a, a young mother's magazine, there may be a free gift. Um, one of the agencies that I worked at specialised in children's books. I worked there for three and a half years. And we used to quite often do stuff like an alphabet that would be printed on a changing mat that would be given away with a, a magazine like Practical Parenting, or an illustration that would be used to do a very simple jigsaw with two pieces or something that a mum would do with a very young child. So this kind of stuff goes on all the time, but it's very easy to think, children's books, not editorial. Um, now, it's really important to understand the breadth of the editorial arena as well, because every person I meet who's just about to leave college, they've just about got the message that editorial is where it's at, and they have all earmarked exactly the same dozen clients as each other. They're all going to the Radio Times, The Guardian, New Scientist, Sunday Colour Supplement, Times Educational Supplement, and there aren't enough jobs to go round. So there's nothing wrong with going to the Radio Times or New Scientist, just as long as you don't hold your breath. And you realise that editorial isn't about what you'd read. It's not about your lifestyle, it's about your livelihood. So it's about you finding punters, however unlikely they sound, to give you work to pay you to make pictures for a living. So there are four sorts of magazine to look into, and they are consumer, trade, professional, and custom. Consumer magazines are the easy ones. They're the ones in WH Smith's. And I sincerely suggest that you go to a really big branch of Smith's on a railway station concourse because if you try it in the high street, they will throw you out after 10, 15 minutes of lurking, looking at magazine titles. If you do it in a railway station, 
no one will care. Because what do people do in railway stations? They get drunk, they go look at magazines, or they buy regrettable sweaters from Monsoon. Whatever they do, they are killing time. And they quite often go into WH Smith's and look at magazines and books for two hours they've got no intention of reading. The staff in there will be used to that, and the staff in there will also be so busy because they've got so many customers coming in that they won't say a dicky bird. So I want you to go into Smith's and I want you to look at every magazine that isn't nailed down unless you find it truly repulsive. So if it's socially, morally or politically questionable, you have my blessing to give it a wide berth. But if it's boring, if it's stuff you wouldn't read, if it's stuff you're convinced wouldn't use you, if it's stuff you're convinced wouldn't use any illustration, no, you have to look at it because you will never know until you do. No matter what the title, no matter how dull it sounds, you will never know unless you look. And every time you look, I want you to expect to be looking at tiny illustrations because a lot of people think, oh, look at all these magazines, they're not using anything. And that's because they're imagining front covers, double page spreads, half page, full page. No, I wish. I wish every magazine had that much illustration in it. But what you're going to be seeing is little tiny spot illustrations a lot of the time. And unless you consciously look for that, your subconscious will say they don't count, they're too little, and you'll move on. So I want you to look for every size. If it's in the editorial itself, it counts. It totally counts. Somebody totally got paid for doing it. So after you've finished in Smith's, trade and professional magazines are the most widely overlooked areas because most people in your position have either never heard of them or they've heard of them, they think they sound really boring, I don't want to be affiliated with them, or they don't know how to find out about them. These magazines are mostly subscription-based, and you will find them in university libraries, like here, in the art school library, you'll find Creative Review and Freeze and Campaign and AN magazine and all sorts of stuff affiliated with art and design and photography and film and all the rest of it. If you were to go to another university campus where they're teaching things like dentistry and psychology and law and town and country planning and God knows what else, they're going to have a ton of stuff you never even dreamed existed. And there are over 5,000 magazines that you will never see in WH Smith's. So if you go that extra mile, it will be worth it. Now these are the magazines that have the dreadful titles that you hear on Have I Got News For You. So they're called things like Water and Waste Treatment, Coal International, The Funeral Director, uh, oh God, I could go on, but I won't, Balloons Europe and Corrosion Control, two of my very favourites. Sadly, Balloons Europe is no longer with us. Um, and Gastrointestinal Nursing. Now, I'm going to use gastrointestinal nursing as a case history because if somebody... Sorry to interrupt you, need to clap up 10 more minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll talk very fast. If somebody had said to me, okay, Fig, what do you think gastrointestinal nursing uses? After I finished laughing, I would have said, oh, uh, hardcore medical scientifically correct illustration and those really awful old git cartoons that look like they were done in the 1950s. And even me, with all my knowledge and foresight, um, I'd still have said that because it just sounds like the absolute pits. Now, the guy I met who worked for gastrointestinal nursing is a fantasy illustrator. He does book covers, mass market book covers of fantastical stuff. And he'd never heard of them. Nothing would have possessed him to look them up. They found him through an ad in Contact Illustrators. And they said, we're doing a supplement about the jobs market. And the theme is from Little Acorns, Mighty Oaks. We'd like you to paint us a dense, fantastical forest with an oak tree and an acorn in the foreground. And I saw it in his folder and I assumed it was a book cover because it was rectangular and he did book covers and it was fancy. So, you see, you don't know. After I saw that, I googled it, and I found out that gastrointestinal nursing was one of eight publications, eight specialist nursing publications produced by the Nursing Standard, who I know perfectly well use really banging illustration and always have. 
I googled it again quite recently, just for shits and giggles, and it's no longer being published by Nursing Standard. It's being published by another medical publisher. Meanwhile, Nursing Standard is publishing about 17 specialist nursing magazines, and quite a lot of them use illustration. So what you may not realise about these magazines is, yes, they have the worst titles on earth and they are hilarious, but they have more creative freedom than the Radio Times could ever dream of. People buy the Radio Times because they like it, and the way it looks is one of the reasons why they like it. They don't need to buy it because you can find out what's on TV from a free newspaper on the train going home at night, from switching on your TV, your digital doodah will tell you, from switching on the internet, from buying a copy of the Weekend Guardian, which has a TV guide in it. You don't have to spend however much a quid or whatever the Radio Times is, but you do it because you like it. And the Radio Times has lots of rivals. And commercial magazines, consumer titles, have endless piffling <coughs> meetings about, oh, our nearest rival sold three copies last Tuesday, and we only sold two. What are we going to do about it? Let's have a redesign. Let's change the name of the magazine. Let's change the look of the magazine. Oh, my God. And if they decided to give their Christmas issue cover to David Shrigley, they would lose an enormous amount of their demographic. They'd probably gain a few, but not as many as they lose. So... They are kind of having to use a certain sort of illustration most of the time. And a, a consumer title is always constrained by their audience. But a professional title, you know, if you're a member of the Metropolitan Police in London, you get a magazine called The Job. And presumably if you get The Job and you don't like the illustration on page 74, you're not going to take out a a subscription to Vogue instead, you're just going to go, well, that's a load of shit, but you're going to read the magazine anyway because you're a police officer. Um, and that means that if the art editor of the job likes really avant-garde, out there, anti-social, all-round traumatising illustration, or just wants to use something a bit different, they can. And nobody's going to stop them. So you have more creative freedom... <laughs> And because most people in your position don't bother to look at these magazines, you have less competition for their favours. So frankly, what's not to like? The custom magazines, or customer magazines, as I mentioned before, these are magazines produced for organisations that provide a service that, that you would subscribe to. So it could be travel on a plane, it could be shopping in a supermarket, shopping using a store card, it could be any amount of, it could be, oh, let me think, being a member of the AA or being a member of the National Trust. These magazines are produced by dedicated publishers who do this on a contractual basis and they're short contracts. So these magazines are sometimes quite short lived, but they are essentially consumer titles. Contract publishers who produce them also produce business-to-business -business titles that you wouldn't normally see. And they also produce staff magazines that you wouldn't normally see for some of the organisations who produce a magazine you would normally see. So they may produce first and second class travel magazines for uh, an airline, and they may also produce a staff magazine for the same airline. And once you get on the circuit of these sorts of publishers, you'll see what kind of stuff they do. And their attitude to commissioning is exactly the same as at any other publisher. If you want to make head or tail of the magazine industry, there is a very useful website that I suggest you look at, which is magforum.com. And it provides web links to piles of publishers. Um, and quite a lot of those web links will allow you to look at magazines that have been digitally archived. Um, so in addition to looking in the university libraries and going into the reference section of the largest public library, you might want to check out those too. And now I've probably run out of time. So uh, have we got two minutes for questions? Yeah. Or? Right. Anybody got any questions, please go ahead. And I don't mind how daft you think it sounds, because it won't be daft to me, and it won't be the first time I've heard it. What sort of portfolios have you dealt with outside of the standard commercial 
illustration sector because uh, we've got some games designers and people like that as well. So. Um, do you have any advice for them? I mean, obviously, a lot of it's pertinent. But... The games world is like a microcosm, and actually, being diverse within that, if you're a concept artist mm. or, or even if you're doing two or three D modelling. Um, being diverse within that is actually a good idea. So it's not the same as, as mainstream illustration yes. because it's a small world comparatively. Yeah. And although there are people who specialise in character development or environments, um, to begin with, getting a foothold before you can specialise, it's good to say, yeah, I do stuff for really young kids, I do environments, I do vehicles, I do characters, I can do anything really. So that would be my advice to them. Yeah. Uh, earlier you mentioned how easy it is to create your own website. Should the student web designers here be worried about something like that? <laughs> no, no, because not every person that you design a website for is going to be a creative practitioner. So, you know, if you run a bakery and you haven't got a creative bone in your body, you're going to get a web designer to do it for you. Um, it's it's a, a different sort of thing, really. Um, there are also, on that subject, there are um, comparison websites to do with web builders. And if you were to Google what is the best website for an illustrator or graphic designer, you will get about a bazillion hits. Um, but bear in mind, you know, as, as an illustrator or graphic designer, you already have a creative bone in your body. So for you, it's going to be easier using something like Moonfruit than it would for the person who owns the cake shop. So I hope that puts your mind at rest a bit. Anybody else? Stunned in horrified silence. <laughs> Actually, can I, tell you, can I just tell you about a magazine that I yeah. looked at recently, or I look at quite often because I did a counselling course, which is Therapy Today, and their illustrations are quite amazing. Yeah. In, in those sorts of healthcare type yes, magazines. Yes, they are. They use absolutely tons. One mm. of my students recently chose to research the use of illustration in healthcare magazines yeah. and health-oriented health magazines. So mm. she did sort of consumer titles as well. Mm. And she found absolutely bucket loads of illustration. Yeah. And it was being used on quite quite a large scale as well. Yeah, quite big, yeah. <laughs> filling up the page sort of thing. Yeah. So, I think people are aware that the mental sessions are too as well. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. You've been a very nice Thank you.